we are again and we're sitting with our Bibles in front of us and we're ready to go. I'm not sure whether today's study is really a Bible study uh, or just a, a biblical exhortation, but whichever category it falls into, I trust it's a blessing to you. These are the days when we need to really know our Bible and read our Bible, discover our Bible. So many people have just got snatches of understanding, little bits here and little bits there. Fragmentary knowledge is not going to be sufficient to carry you through in this day, this age, or at any time in our lives. And the Bible tells us that we need to know the whole counsel of God. And that was the Apostle Paul's great commitment. When he met the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, he said that he had never shunned sharing with them, and I'm sure with others and everybody that he touched with his ministry, he said, I've never shunned uh, declaring to you the whole, the overall counsel of God. And so uh, we need to do that. Now tonight, or today, or this morning, wherever you are, and whatever the time zone, we're turning to 2 Kings chapter 6. This is a, a marvelous a series of events in the life and the ministry of Elisha, the man who sought for, desired, asked for, and expected and received a double portion of all that his mentor, his predecessor, Elijah, had ever had. He wanted double the anointing. What a tremendous, uh, a tremendous desire to have. If you found somebody that you admire in God, you found someone that you trust who's been a blessing to you and imparted great things supernaturally to you, and then you ask that you want a continuation of that person's ministry, but on a double level. And that's what he got. Uh, Elijah said quite wisely, well, it's not for me to give you that. It's only going to come from one source, and that's God. But God honored that prayer and that desire that Elisha had. Shall we turn to chapter 6? And I'm going to read from the second section of this particular scripture. It's only a small one but it's something that is going to be the springboard into our discussion today. The king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you pass not such a place, for that's where the Syrians have come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place of which Elisha told and warned him, and thus he protected and saved himself there repeatedly. Therefore the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. He called his servants and said, Will you show me who of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedchamber. He said, go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him. And it was told him, he is in Dothan. So the Syrian king sent their horses, chariots, and a great army. They came by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God rose early and went out, Behold, an army with horses and chariots were around the city. Elisha's servant said to him, Alas, my lord, what shall we do? 
Elisha answered, Fear not, for those with us are more than those with them. Then Elisha prayed, Lord, I pray you, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. And when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, smite this people with blindness, I pray you. And God smote them with blindness as Elisha asked. And the story goes on beyond that. We live in tremendous days. I don't have to tell you or remind you of that. We live in days where it is imperative that we belong to a prophetic church, not a pathetic church, a prophetic church. What is a prophetic church? Well, of course, it is a church that moves in the miraculous. And I'm not just talking about signs and wonders of healings and miracles. I believe in all of that. But I believe that we should be a a church, a prophetic church, that has a prophetic and has a, a relevant, it has a powerful, it has a potent message for the generation that we find ourselves in. And the set of circumstances that both the world and the church are interrelating in. And, and we are. We look around and uh, our neighbours and we are all in this situation together. But there has to be a distinction between the worldling and the members of the body of Christ. There has to be light and salt and the impact of a miraculous experience that we don't just have but live in and operate in, and that's the prayer of my heart. So a prophetic church is a miraculous church, and um, it's typified in the life and the confidence and in the manifestations of God in and through Elisha at that crucial time. It's a church, a prophetic church, is a a mysterious church. It doesn't fit into the capsule or the expectations of the world. You talk to a worldly person. We have neighbours all around that we have good conversations with and I trust have a godly import and input into their lives. But uh, when you talk to them and they talk about church, you can see straight away in their mind their concept of church. It's uh, a building. It's nice people, wholesome people, hymn-singing people, uh, people that go regularly and sit in pews and listen to a 20-minute dissertation about God all things related to God. And so they're, they're quite impressed by that. They think that's a nice way to spend a Sunday morning. But as to having a 24-hour impacting life, a miraculous life, well, that's mysterious to them. When you start talking to them about spiritual things, and you talk about answers to prayer, when they bring up issues that you can see are troubling them and you tell them that Jesus is the answer, that God cares, God is able to minister to them and meet them, you can see the look on their face. Some of them are incredulous. That is, they're not sure that a nice person like you and a person they thought was rather intelligent is sort of um, talking about something that is remote, pie in the sky, something that is mystical, something they can't understand, something they have never had experience of. Oh, yes, they've, they've brushed with the church. They've seen the steeples and they've seen the pews and the altar and they've known that rituals of one kind or another takes place, but they have no concept of 
God manifesting himself in power, in blessing, in provision, and certainly not in salvation, redemption, and deliverance. So um, the church that they look upon and the one that you're talking about is quite different. And the one that we're talking about, focusing on and praying for, is a prophetic church that is miraculous. You see, that which governed Elisha's life was the miraculous. He had concepts of divine reality. And therefore, he wasn't in any way, shape or form put off by the fact that the Syrians had come to abduct him, take him, probably try him, torture him, find out the key to his success, why he knew what he knew, how he knew it, and then they would have ultimately no doubt got rid of him, and that was their intention. But Elisha's not worried. I find out in the, uh, in the book of Acts that Peter, on the very eve of the day he was supposedly going to be executed by the then Herod uh, is asleep. He's resting in the Lord. No worries. You see, they live in the miraculous. They don't just get touched by it at crucial times in their lives. They live in that consciousness of the miraculous. And that is to the worldling and to the carnal Christian and the religious person a bit mysterious a little bit way out, a little bit uh, hard to understand, and perhaps even hard to accept. Now, the prophetic church is a highly motivated church. It is miraculous in its working. It's mysterious sometimes in its testimony, but it's also motivated from within. But what is it motivated by? The prophetic church, the church that Jesus wants to inhabit and to manifest himself through is a church that is motivated by a passion for the will of God at every juncture and every part of its journey. It wants to be a church that is not just on fire with, with zeal and excitement and passion. It wants to have the motivation that it is fulfilling the plan and the purpose of God right now. And should the circumstances change, that motivation will be just the same. Lord, now we're in a different state, a different era a, a different uh, set of circumstances make us relevant to it. So it's a motivated church, motivated by the wisdom of God, the passion for God, the desire and the yieldedness to do the will of God, and to certainly be motivated by the love of God, compassion for those that are in dreadful need and in confusion. If you're not motivated by the love of God, you will never achieve anything by God or for God because God is love and he's wanting to reach into people's lives. He's wanting to touch men and women, whoever they are, wherever they're at, whatever their circumstance, even whatever their sin, God wants to change lives. That should be the motivation of the prophetic church. And then... The prophetic church has a clear message. The message of the prophetic church is clearly enunciated, defined, and passionately declared. We state what we know. That's what the apostles said when they were on trial before the Sanhedrin in the early part of Acts, around Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, they said, we can but only testify to that which we have seen, that which we have heard, and that which we 
have known. And John the Apostle said the same thing, didn't he? He said, that which we have handled, that which we have heard, that which we know, we share with you. And that is the message. And the message is Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The constancy of Jesus Christ as a person and as a redeemer, and the message is him and all that he has done, all that he wills, and all that he's doing, and all that he will yet do. I've mentioned that it's a church that is moved. You remember that story about the Good Samaritan. The Levite didn't want to be in any way, shape, or form defiled. His religion and his sincerity for that religion was that he would never touch a corpse. He looked upon the one that had fallen by the wayside and had been uh, abused and assaulted by thieves and robbed. He thought, oh, I think he could be dead, or if I start doing something to, to, to help him and he dies, then I am ceremonially unclean. And therefore, oh, better not touch him. Now, the priest that came by, he said the same thing. And it was the Good Samaritan that overshadowed religion by a great compassion that Jesus shows us. You see, people count. People he cares for, loves, cherishes their hurts, their pain their sin, their wounds, the things that have brought them to ruin, they move our Saviour with compassion. And that should be very evident in the prophetic church. Now, let's talk about it. A little bit more detail. What is this prophetic church? Well, to me, it is primarily and basically foundationally a revelatory church. What's a revelatory church mean? Well, it's one that lives in revelation. We know the mind, we know the will, we know the plan, we know the calendar of God, we know his purpose. We know all the things that God is seeking to do today. And we, as a result, knowing the revelation of the revealed will of God, align ourselves with that. Who, knowing the will of God, we are able to adjust our life and our lifestyle and our heart's attitude and we commit to that which we know. Now, the Bible tells us that we're not to be ignorant about the times and the seasons. We know, none of us know, Nothing about the day or the hour of Jesus appearing, but the times and the seasons, they will point to an approximate time. And I'm sure you're like me. You believe that we are in the end times. I believe that we are in very crucial times. Throughout the world, there are variations of the same dilemma. We have a pandemic. We have partial or extreme lockdown, depending on each particular government that uh, rules wherever and whatever region we are in. Now, that shows me that that's just one of the massive and one of the most uh, uh, tremendous signs of Jesus coming, that there will be pandemics, there will be worldwide pestilences. Not just people getting the flu, but getting life-threatening diseases. And it would appear that throughout the world, most of the leaders of the nations are very concerned that they need to absolutely work almost feverishly, to coin a very bad pun, they need to get to the point where they can prevent this uh, skyrocketing out of control. 
And as a result, we're in a lockdown situation with all the pressures and the problems that that brings. And it does, socially, mentally, emotionally, and so on. But a prophetic church and a believer in the prophetic church and certainly the leadership and the preachers of the prophetic church can see the times, they see the seasons, and they interpret them and they know, hey, this is the time where we're coming to the revelation of Jesus Christ in the second coming. And so the message is sharper more clear, more, I would say, convicting and impacting. So we're a church that lives in revelation. We know the mind of God. We know the will of God. We see the calendar of God. It's clear to us. And accordingly, we live our lives and we exercise our prayer life, our ministries, whatever those ministries may be, in seeing the church purified, seeing the church revived, and seeing it fruitful unto every good work, and having impact in the world around us. Secondly, we have to be a realistic church. There's been a lot of, I suppose, well, I think it's rubbish, but there's been a lot of platitudes over the years People who hate to have the needs of the church exposed. And they'll say to you, if you highlight some areas that you believe need to be changed, you see situations in the church that uh, beggar your, uh, uh, you know, your, your belief and you say to yourself, well, how come we'll accept this and uh, we've become so compromising? And when we speak up, over the years, the last 30 years or even more, there have been those amongst us and a growing multitude of saying, oh, look, don't be negative. Be positive. Oh, don't present a, a negative uh, uh, picture. Uh, don't come across as a Bible basher. Don't look as though you're negative and down on people and legalistic. We hear that term all the time. Look, Let's stop there. We need to be realistic. For the church to be a prophetic church, and effectively so, we need to be able to identify those underlying problems in the church that cause us to be weakened in our testimony and, sadly, not to have the impact that we desire and more so that God desires. God wants us to be a voice, even if it may cause uh, upsurges of, of varying types of persecution. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We must be faithful. We must be true to the biblical record, to the biblical standards. We must live according to the word and according to the will and purpose of God. And we must be reflectors of the nature of God, which is holy. And I've felt many times the Spirit of God saying to me, I want you to adjust your life accordingly. You are an end time, a second coming Christian, and you need to live and you need to breathe and you need to, in a wonderful way, identify with that and live the life and preach that message. So we are to be realistic. We're able to look at the church and without condemnation and without being in any way, shape or form uh, judgmental from a sort of pious, sort of uh, self-righteous position, we are able to say, hey, this is wrong in the church and we need to get back to the basics. Now, the Apostle Paul, <coughs> when he wrote his epistles, you will find that in the majority they were corrective. They were correcting all kinds of things. I could give you a rundown on the varying uh, corrections that Paul felt had to be made. I mean, he found a very, very potentially powerful church in Corinth, but he has two letters that we know of to that church telling them where they had to make adjustments, where they had to pull up their socks, 
where they had to be obedient to biblical standards because they were in disarray. So it was the church in northern Greece in Thessalonica. And uh, there are two epistles there. And of course, he speaks to the church at Colossae, the church at Ephesus, all about their problems. Now, no one says, oh, Paul, you shouldn't say that because you're now becoming negative. He was a realistic man. He knew the Bible. He knew the standards of the word of God. And consequently, he, looking at the state of the church, said changes must be made. So if you want to be in a prophetic church or lead a prophetic church, or be a prophetic believer within the prophetic church, you will have to be not only revelatory, but that revelation, that understanding of the nature of God, the will of God, the purpose of God, you will, knowing that, will be realistic. You will identify all kinds of issues and problems that need change. Now, the Prophetic church is a relevant church. I want to be relevant. I don't want to be talking about things and taking Bible studies that have no bearing whatsoever on the present crucial day that we find ourselves in. And we are in crucial days, aren't we? We're in tremendous days. We're in uh, dark days for many, many people. And we need a message that is going to hit right where the need is at its greatest. We need to come with the word of the Lord. And that's exactly what the prophets of old did. They would come with the burden of the Lord. And when they came to the people, be it Israel or Judah or wherever, uh, or wider to the nations, they would come with a biblically relevant message. How relevant are you in your testimony? You've got people all around you that are troubled and they're wondering what in the world is going on? How many times have you heard people say, look, a year ago, we knew nothing of this. We had plans. We had purposes. We were, we were working towards what we were going to do in 2020. And and it just looks as though though all those plans have just gone. What's going on? Can't travel. Don't even know whether I'll have a job in a couple of months' time. How am I going to meet my needs? How am I going to meet my obligations? How am I going to service loans? What's going on? And the the leaders of this world are all sort of in a, a, a terrible huddle and don't seem to have any solutions. What's going on? Where is it all leading? And that's where you and I, prophetic believers, are relevant to that controversy, relevant to that confusion, relevant to that that upheaval of mind. And we can say, this is that which was spoken by the prophets. How wonderful to sit down with someone who is confused, and to be able to lead them out of that confusion so they have an understanding of the will of God, the purpose of God, the plan of God, the upheaval in the world, and what they can do and be to be part of God's solution. So we want to be a relevant church. Well, how are you relevant? Well, by being a reliant church. What's a reliant church? A church that relies on something or some things. What are we reliant on? Well, we're reliant on the Holy Spirit of God. We are totally reliant upon him. We need his leading. We need his grace. We need his moving. We need his prompting. We need his wisdom. And we need the empowering to speak the words of God. And then there will be effective change. So we in our prayer are relating to God and we are relying upon him. We are reliant in prayer. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says that there is the burden, the Spirit of God burdening us with words that cannot be uttered. There are groans within our spirit. And that intercession should be greater than ever before. I've just come from a prayer meeting today. And, uh, and I just was glad to hear people praying along this way. I believe I'm part of a relevant church, but also a reliant church. Because we are relevant, because we understand the times and the seasons, we understand too that we need the outpouring, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the ministries, plural, of the Holy Spirit in prayer and in preaching, in sharing and in studying, in understanding and in our daily walk with the Lord. Now, a prophetic church is a resilient church. What does that mean? Well, in spite of the initial scorn that we will get when you start talking about the coming of the Lord, people will say, oh, we've heard that before, and oh, that's old hat, and there's too much controversy in that subject. Why let's, uh, no, no, we're not going to get go down that track. So there's sort of uh, impatience and scorn that you have to put up with sometimes. But we're resilient. We, we preach in season, when it's appropriate, when it's welcomed, when it's comfortable, when it's well received, and out of season, when people are not interested. We share the word of God. You know, God will confirm his word with witness and with signs following. But the word has to be shared. And just about now, people are really listening. They are really listening and they are beginning to think, hey, there is something in that message. So we are resilient. We come back time and time again. And in order to be resilient, we need to be one, filled with the grace of God, filled with the blessing of God, filled with the strength and stability and stamina of God. And we also need to know the word of God. We need to really faithfully seek God through the scriptures and have the Spirit of God make those scriptures real. I was in a shop just recently, only about four days ago, and talking to a friend of mine there who works in that shop. And someone I've never met, didn't know, in fact, didn't even know they were behind me, heard every word and said, ah, that was so important to hear what you just said. It gave them light in their tunnel of darkness. That's marvellous, isn't it? And if we're faithful, faithful to the message, faithful to the Lord, then God will bless us and we will be refreshing, we will be vital, we will be relevant, as we've said, and we will be resilient will rise up and say, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel or whatever prophet relating to these prophetic mysteries. You know, they're only mysteries until you reveal them and the Spirit of God takes what you say and applies it to listening hearts, not just listening ears, but listening hearts. Now, the prophetic church has to be of necessity living in a constancy of repentance. Repentance. Now, we live in, in, in a, a so-called advanced society. And yet we are thwarted and saddened and troubled because we believe there are judgments coming on the earth because of the decisions that parliaments and governments and individuals who put those parliaments or those governments into power uh, have allowed things, things like abortion, things like same-sex marriage, like euthanasia. We were talking about that and praying about that today. Things that God forbids. God outlaws certain things for mankind's sake. God loves humanity. He wants to safeguard humanity 
from the disasters and the destruction that has often come upon whole nations when they've departed from biblical standards. And we, the church, need to be repentant because we've not been strong always to speak up and to be that prophetic voice that says, thus says the Lord. You know, there are many people in our society, in Western society, that are afraid of scorn, afraid of being ridiculed, afraid of being put down or marginalized. We don't have the fears of those in North Korea or China or parts of India or Africa or other places in the world where to be a Christian in the Middle East, to be an out-and-out Christian, may indeed mean imprisonment. It could even mean martyrdom. We don't have that problem here, not in the main, but so many of us shrink away if we think that speaking up for Jesus will cause a snigger, will cause people to ridicule us or to make light of what we're saying and marginalize us and put us in a category of the lunatic fringe. So what? So what? We need to be repentant. We need to say, Lord, we've allowed people to put us down and we've stayed down and we've been quiet and consequently all these things have happened in our parliaments edicts and laws have been made that are an absolute abhorrence to almighty god who is holy righteous and just we need to repent and we need to repent because we ourselves sometimes have succumbed to that ease of life that a very, very, very casual, compromising church adopts. We are casual about holiness. We don't like the word. We don't like the word sanctification. When did you last hear a message on that? Oh, yes, you'll hear vaguely that we're to be like Jesus, but it's usually in temperament, in personality, not in lifestyle. And so there's the gospel of allowance, a gospel that's compromising, a gospel that takes away and ruins the effectiveness and the power that is in the gospel of Jesus. I am repenting, and repentance is not just a one-off experience. It's a lifestyle where I say, Lord, according to your scripture, it's no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I need to repent and be repentant, not just over acts, not just over uh, one-off attitudes, but I live like Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 6. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in a nation, a people who are unclean of speech as well. I need a purging. I need a cleansing. I do too. And perhaps you feel like I feel a need for a double dose of a refining process. Now, a repentant church is one that stands on the threshold of what God wants to do. It becomes very soon after a revived church, a renewed church, a reconstituted church, a rebuilt church, a church that is built up in the most holy faith of God. The book of Jude, the second last book of the New Testament, second last book of the Bible, obviously, the book of Jude talks about building ourselves up and building ourselves up in our most holy faith, taking time out, thinking about it, 
adjusting our life, repenting of compromise, repenting of, of dilly-dallying and, and sidestepping major issues, repenting of prayerlessness, repenting of being caught up and enamored and absorbed in lesser things, that is, things that are not the primary will of God. We need a revival. We need a refreshing. We need to be rebuilt. We need to be a reliable church. We need to be a refined church. I like it when people say from time to time, oh, something's happened to you. We can tell. You're different. What is it? And it's usually after I've had a time of heart searching and thought, my goodness, my life has become very lax. My life has become very, maybe even opportunistic. Opportunistic is a, a life where we just live for ourselves. Selfish. 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 Looking out always for opportunities that satisf satisfy us. God wants us to do something better than that. He wants us to live for him. I no longer live. It's Christ who lives in me. And so um, we want to be a refined church. We want to be a redefined church. How many times do you sit back and sit down and say to yourself, now what is the church all about? What is the church? And you do a little private study. Now, am I part of that church? Am I a prophetic Christian? Am I speaking the words of life? Last night as I slept and woke a few times, I was aware of a, a song going through my spirit, into my mind, into my heart, into my emotions. And I heard it time and time again through the night. Sing them over to me again, wonderful words of life. And I thought, Lord, I want to recommit to singing and speaking the words of life. In Jeremiah, there is a, a very, very wonderful portion, a promise from God to Jeremiah. He says, if you will separate the divine from the mundane, the pure and the purified word of God from the unclean, the dabblings of the world and worldliness. If you will give yourself to only speaking the profound word of God, then you will be my voice piece. You will be my representative and I will bless you. And I'm making that my prayer. I want a reconstituted core. I want a revived core. I want to be rerouted in the word of God and rerouted in the journey of the purposes of God for my life. I want to be refreshed in my own soul and a refreshment to others. Coming to a conclusion, the prophetic church must be a righteous church and I can tell you it will be a rewarded church. One thing it will never be is a removed church. Remember in Revelation chapter 2, for chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation, John the Apostle speaks to the seven churches of Asia Minor and he commences with the church at Ephesus. And he says, I know your works. I know pure doctrine and how you're committed to it. I know all that. I know that you even hate certain things that I hate. But you've left your first love. You've left the controlling factor of your heart and life. The motivation of all that makes you true example and reflection of me. 
And I caution you to be restored or I will take your candlestick away and remove it. And sadly, there is no church in Ephesus today. There is no city of Ephesus. It's just countless ruins. An amazing place to visit. And I've gone there a number of times, maybe five or six or seven times I've been there. Walked down those marble streets. Looked at some of the uh, rebuilt buildings where they've propped some of the buildings back up and uh, you can get a picture of what it would have been like. But there's always a tinge of sadness when I walk down that, uh, that descent and I think to myself, this used to be a thriving city. It was right on the Mediterranean and then uh, it all silted up around the river there and uh, it just became no longer one of the major uh, commercial cities of the world. But worse than that, once there was a powerful church. John the Apostle was part of the congregation. It is said by tradition, and I'm not sure whether it's fact, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was taken there by John and lived there in the foothills overlooking Ephesus, the city. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing, there is no church there. There is no city. The candle has been removed. I believe that many people today have trusted in a feel-good church, a happy-go-lucky church, a casual and shallow church, anything but the scriptures, anything but the hard facts, anything but the truth that goes against and cuts against their lives. And they have become loveless as far as their relationship with God. Oh yes, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. How sad that is. They were the opportunists. They were those that were selfish and worldly and compromising. And I, but by the grace of God, would be one of those. I love my life. I love the good things of life. It's rather serious, isn't it? Can I ask you, in closing, are you part of a prophetic church? Is your local congregation prophetic? Are they powerful in God? Are they relevant? Are they revived? Are they refreshing? Well, you'll be rewarded if that is so. And what about you? Are you a prophetic believer? In these last days, are you speaking up? speaking out, declaring whether there's favour or disfavour, whether you're popular or unpopular, whether you're welcomed or rejected. Are you saying to yourself, well, as for me and my house, this is the book and this is the message and this is my commitment that I will preach this word and be faithful to its message and faithful to the will of God. And I want to tell you, you'll always be safe. You'll always be stable. You'll always be secure. Remember the scripture reading we read before? <gasps> Says the servant of Elisha, when he got up in the morning, he said, oh my goodness, we're under threat. Oh my goodness, the armies of Syria are here and there is no doubt they're not looking for my neighbours, they're looking for us. My master, and because he's my master, me. Oh master, Elisha, we're in trouble. No, we're not. We're not in trouble, said Elisha. He said there are more that are for us than against us. Oh, I hope so. Well, he prayed for him. He said, Lord, open his eyes that this servant of mine will see the divine reality. 
fill him with revelation, understanding, so that he can commit himself and be at peace. And the Bible tells us the eyes of the servant were opened. He saw heaven filled with chariots upon the mountains and above. And he knew that greater in number and in power were those that were with him, Elisha and his servant, than those that had come against him from Syria. And I want to tell you, if you live in that revelation, you will be a positive, faith-filled, faithful believer and you'll bring blessing to all those people you meet and your whole generation. You will pray in the Spirit and you'll see miracles. Oh, God wants you, God wants me, God wants all of us to be part of the great army of God in this end time. We are in the end times, and it's up to you to make a choice to be a pathetic part of the church or a prophetic part of the church. Father, help us. Help us, Lord. Get inside of us, I pray. Change our attitudes. Change our heart. Motivate us. Clarify our mind. And help us to adjust our lives to suit your will, to suit your purpose, and to identify and declare your message in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. See you again real soon.